Okay. Um, so because it's it's 12 o'clock, I think we might make a start. I think people are continuing to dial in um, and I'm sure that that will keep on occurring during the early minutes of this webinar. Um, I would like to welcome everybody, first of all, to this webinar, which is the uh, fourth webinar in our uh, SA POCOG uh, seminar series. Uh, and then I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands from which we're all dialing into this meeting today. Uh, so for me, that's the Paramount people of the Adelaide Hills. Uh, for many people in SA POCOG in Adelaide, it will be the Ghana people. Um, and I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the other lands uh, from which people are likely to be dialing in around Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also extend that respect to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who are dialing in today. Um, so a bit of housekeeping before we start, uh, a reminder to everybody to have their microphone on mute. Um, which I see people have, which is great. Um, obviously, uh, that doesn't apply to the question session at the end. During, um, during uh, people's presentations, if you do have questions uh, that you would like uh, to raise at the end, it'd be great if you could put that in the chat function so that I can facilitate that question session at the end and uh, maybe raise the questions that people are uh, asking about most frequently. Um, another bit of housekeeping is that today's session is being recorded um, and this will be later appearing on the POCOG YouTube channel. So uh, it's important for everybody to be aware uh, that this session is being recorded today. Um, Bonnie, I don't think I've forgotten any of the housekeeping points. Brilliant. Um, so we'll go straight on to the presentations then. Uh, the first person presenting today is uh, Associate Professor Lisa Beatty from Flinders University. Uh, so Lisa is going to be uh, presenting on her body of work on uh, digital health in psycho-oncology, including uh, the Finding My Way and Finding My Way advanced, uh, advanced Interventions. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, Emma. Um, just letting everyone know as well, I am currently um, working from home slash kind of on sick leave. So if I end up coughing through this um, and a bit nasal, um, that's the reason. So I'll, I'll just bear with me and we'll get through this. All right. So um, without further ado, we'll just share my slides. And this will just take a little bit. Oh, and hopefully that's all working for everyone. Can we all see that clearly? Maybe if anyone could just give me a thumbs yep. up. Yep, okay, yep. fantastic. Yep. All right. <laughs> um, so yes, as Emma um, outlined, my name's um, Lisa Beatty. I'm an Associate Professor in Clinical Psychology at Flinders University. And I'm also a consulting clinical psychologist um, in the Cancer Wellness Centre at uh, Flinders Medical Centre. Um, so today I will be uh, presenting on uh, the body of work that um, myself and my colleagues have been doing over the last this is a very long time now, probably the last 15 years, uh, developing online interventions to support people with cancer um, called Finding My Way. In particular for this um, presentation, though, I wanted to focus in on the kind of the most recent directions we're taking with it um, as we've adapted this program for women with metastatic breast cancer called Finding My Way Advanced, and that's the trial that's about to, to roll out nationally. So I thought we, it would be worth our while to focus in on that one. Um, and as Emma said, I'd also like just to acknowledge um, that we're, well, for me personally, I'm meeting on the lands of the Ghana people and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, let's see if I can get this all to work. So um, just to set the scene um, and talking about digital interventions more broadly, in the past 15 years, um, as we all know, there's been a surge of research um, in online interventions. Um, and we, this has been across a variety of, of domains in cancer, predominantly though focusing on cancer survivorship um, or the post-treatment cancer survivorship space. The reason why this has been um, so prominent has been that 86% of all Australian households now have uh, internet access um, at home and that we are multi-platform users. So increasingly, you know, when, when I started doing this research back in 
2008-2009, um, it was all about doing this work on PCs, um, whereas now um, really if you don't have a multi-platform program set up that can be used on devices, then it's, it's not going to be particularly well utilised. Um, I can hear some noise, so I'm just going to just do a bit of a call out in general if we can just make sure that we're all on mute when we're um, not pre presenting, if that's okay. Um, so yeah, in terms of what we also know is that people are um, increasingly accessing the internet, and this certainly predated COVID, but it's um, even more so, uh, that we know that um, people are accessing the internet for health services and health research, uh, with the increases going up from 22% in 2014 and 15, up to 46% in 2016, 17. And I think we can all hazard a guess at what the, those rates would look like if we were to look at it from 2020 onwards. So yes, the, the area has had already been kind of blossoming before COVID hit. And then obviously with the advent of COVID, um, that only amplified, served to amplify and really, um, I guess, make it salient how important it is to, to have digital options for, um, for the provision of psychosocial support. Um, in Australia, we're actually really lucky. We, maybe it's because of geography, but even again, before COVID hit, we had already been leading the way in terms of developing online programs. And there's a whole heap of them that we've developed over time, including focusing on particular cancer um, groups, such as those in, who are rurally or regionally residing, such as country cancer support, um, looking at particular um, cancer diagnostic groups, such as testicular cancer or prostate cancer, looking at, for example, some of the specific psychosocial impacts that might happen, um, including things like cancer-related sexual dysfunction with um, the Rekindle program. And then there are also the transdiagnostic programs um, for cancer-related depression and anxiety, for fear of recurrence, um, and also in cancer survivorship, which you'll be hearing more about from Morgan Next, um, an online Healthy Living After Cancer program. Um, now, as you would already note, one of the challenges just from this slide, um, one of the challenges that can come up in the area of digital interventions is that we get funding to create them, um, you know, get ready research funding to create them but what happens after the the clinical trials finish that quite often these programs are no longer live there's no longer ongoing funding for them um, so on top of the ones that I've outlined here we also developed our own finding my way um, program and unlike the previous slides which all pretty much um, nearly all of them focus as I say on that post-treatment cancer survivorship space when we designed Finding My Way, we were very much designing it for those who are recently diagnosed with cancer, being treated with curative intent. Um, and what do we find with this? It's, um, we found that both groups reduced, um, so we, in a national randomised clinical trial, we found that those, um, yeah, so compared to a control condition, uh, there was significantly better emotional functioning three months after receiving the program, um, and significantly lower total health service use and supportive care practitioner use um, in the post-treatment phase as well. So while both groups, um, our control group in this um, trial, oops, sorry, um, our control group in this trial received a psychoeducational condition. Um, so they actually did receive quite an active mini lower dose intervention. So we did find that both groups reduced in distress, um, but yes, that we, that those who were assigned into the intervention group had significantly better emotional functioning. So they were managing that distress better and it was having less of an impact on their lives. Um, so of note, the other thing to note, I think from the programs that I've outlined so far is that none of the programs developed to date, or at least at the time that we started doing um, our research in this area, had targeted the needs of um, cancer, uh, those with cancer that couldn't be cured um, or advanced or um, metastatic cancer. So to address that gap uh, more recently, we uh, and based on some of the things that I was seeing clinically as well in the hospital is that many of the needs um, overlapped, but obviously some of the needs um, and concerns that the people with advanced or incurable cancers were expressing to me um, were different. So, um, and, and but that this is also a population that reports feeling like they're underserviced or under, um, yeah, they're often overlooked. So to address these gaps clinically, as well as from the research literature, we co-designed Finding My Way Advance. Um, so I thought I'd go over why I think this is important um, and using metastatic breast cancer, I guess, as um, a, you know, trying to work out, can we make it work for this population? And then if we can 
demonstrate that it works, can we then broaden out to other um, incurable or advanced cancer groups? Um, so in terms of understanding why it's important to target um, people who have got incurable cancer, we know that in 2022 alone, nearly 20,000 Australian women will be diagnosed with um, breast cancer. Um, and of those, 5% will be diagnosed with what's called de novo metastatic breast cancer. So it is their first diagnosis of cancer. Oh, sorry, it keeps flicking ahead on me. Um, and that of those who previously had an earlier stage cancer, 10% uh, will go on to progress having metastatic disease. So that results in approximately 3,000 women every year who are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Um, and given that we know we've got improved treatments and survival durations, uh, the prevalent number of women who are living with metastatic breast cancer is increasing. We also know that while their medical treatments are improving, the diagnosis um, brings significant challenges and impacts, including clinically elevated distress, so depression, anxiety, and fear of progression are the three of the most um, commonly experienced concerns. There's um, impaired quality of life and unmet needs are reported in up to 68% of women who are surveyed. Um, and again, fear of progression and fatigue and uncertainty about the future are the top three um, concerns that are, are reported there. And if left untreated, there is significant potential that the um, health service impacts as well. And as a result of this um, really significant impact, um, Cancer Australia's position statement argues for the management of symptoms and optimization of quality of life as the key treatment targets for women with metastatic breast cancer. And psychological interventions are critical to achieving this. As I said before, few interventions are currently available. Um, and the, the State of the Nation report from Breast Cancer Network Australia said that women with metastatic breast cancer are underserved and receive less support than women with earlier stage disease. Um, so, even excluding online interventions, um, just looking at any interventions that have been developed to date, there's only been 19 RCTs that have been conducted since 1981. So that's in the last 40, uh, 41 years. Um, and the majority of those have been delivered in group or individual settings. Um, and the challenge that we've kind of encountered in this area is that those psychosocial interventions that have the strongest evidence of efficacy actually also have the highest participation burden and the lowest adherence and uptake rates. In contrast, low intensity interventions were, um, have not been really um, explored too much in this population with only three telephone and two expressive writing um, interventions tested and none have been tested online. So why is it that we would want to particularly look at um, an online intervention for those with metastatic breast cancer? Well, there are some real barriers to accessing face-to-face treatment options, including um, illness barriers. So this is a, a group who um, are actually experiencing significant illness burden um, uh, and attending multiple other appointments for their illness. There could be geographic barriers for those that live rurally or um, regionally. There's also personal barriers that um, it could be that there are multiple other roles that they're, they're juggling um, or also the ongoing stigma associated with accessing mental health services. And of course, uh, for us, we've got the workforce shortfall, which is one of the, um, I think has been really highlighted since COVID. Um, it, was, it was bad before and it's worse now in terms of actually being able to access psychosocial support. So that led us to um, co-designing um, and adapting our original Finding My Way program and tailoring it to those um, with metastatic breast cancer. So the co-design process that we adopted um, was a, a user-centered design where we started out with identifying what the, um, now if I can make it work here, I don't know if we can see the mouse on at all or not, um, but we started with uh, um, identifying what the user needs and requirements are through conducting some interviews with um, and conducting stakeholder consultation with our research group um, and interviews with women with metastatic breast cancer and presenting them with our existing um, scenario of uh, finding my way and getting feedback from them about what modifications were needed. Um, we then, after get, getting that um, evaluation from them, we then were able to really develop a, a tailored version of the program, Finding My Way Advanced, and test that for usability. So I thought I'd quickly um, step us through how we did this. Um, so in the steps one to three of this co-design process, this was scoping out um, 
I guess, the, the need. And we conducted, it was a mixed method study of 49 women with metastatic breast cancer, um, aged between 34 and 76, um, and found that 51% of women with metastatic breast cancer either currently did or would use the internet for seeking cancer-related information and support. Um, and again, that the most sought after topics was the fear of progression, coping with side effects and planning for the future. 80% of those respondents endorsed the idea of a tailored program. And then um, in steps two to three of this co-design process, we found that women really did endorse the adaptation of the original Finding My Way program. Um, and of note, some of the important feedback received was that even in its current unaltered version, um, many of the, much of the content was already still therapeutic and helpful. But the areas that really needed to be focused in on were um, to change the language, um, to avoid some of the, the language around transitioning to survivorship, as this was not something that they felt they would be surviving, but instead learning to live well with. Um, and yet to develop some more tailored content around living well with metastatic disease. So that led us to developing um, a prototype, our pilot version of the, the program. And this is um, what the user dashboard looked like in the, in the first iteration. And it's, it's largely unchanged now. Um, where when people log in and create their accounts, this is their, their kind of personalised user dashboard, which summarises the six key modules um, that they are able to access. And it covers some of the most commonly experienced concerns from navigating their diagnosis or um, interacting with their healthcare team, to the unique challenges that they might experience when they're navigating metastatic disease, coping with physical symptoms and side effects, coping with emotional distress, um, how they see themselves in terms of roles and identity, um, and also coping with concerns that come up amongst their social support networks and, and helping to support their family and friends. So what we ended up doing at this point in the co-design process was presenting um, women with, um, with the program and then doing a think aloud protocol where they actually click through and work out how to use the program and we are capturing their concerns that are coming up, um, any issues and pragmatic issues that might be coming up during that phase as well. And we were able to make modifications based on what some of the pragmatic usability concerns were that were emerging, as well as if there were any things that were kind of not quite hitting the mark, we were getting that general feedback in this stage of testing as well in co-design. So, uh, yep, um, that led to us having our final design um, that emerged from it. Um, and this is where we're up to um, now where, oh, no, sorry, the next stage was feasibility testing, um, where we then took this to a small randomised pilot trial um, with the aim of assessing the feasibility of the program um, through a single site trial. Um, and this is where we had women who had stage four metastatic breast cancer with a life expectancy of over six months, aged 18 plus, uh, who had internet and email access and um, were proficient in English. And they were recruited, now if you have a look at the dates, they were recruited between the 27th of February, 2020. Um, literally, I think that was 10 days before, or two weeks before um, all of the impact of COVID hit. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, these were recruited through community networks and social media adverts. Um, and they were emailed the website link, completed a baseline survey, and then were randomised. So either our intervention, which was the program plus usual care, um, or the... Um, control condition, which was receiving Breast Cancer Networks Australia's Hope and Hurdles kit. Um, for this stage um, in co-design, we're really trying to demonstrate feasibility in terms of what were the recruitment rates and uptake rates, what was the retention like, how many modules were completed, um, how many people completed the survey. And we also collected some data that we haven't looked at yet um, on signals of efficacy. So in terms of results, um, recruitment commenced, as I said, two weeks before um, COVID hit. So we ended up having to pause recruitment and then resume slowly as of July, 2020. Um, and then we did find that we didn't hit our recruitment target of 40, but we got really close. We got 35 participants where we had 17 intervention and 18 control participants with a recruitment rate demonstrated therefore of 2.9 per month. The uptake rate was actually quite, um, really quite good. We had 61% of those that were eligible that took it up. And this really varied by um, the recruitment method where we found that Facebook advertising was definitely the most efficient. We only had six weeks um, of recruiting through Facebook and we had 15 women consent through that compared to recruiting through clinicians for basically the whole year and only um, you know, having much smaller numbers through, through that recruitment method. So 
that's a great for in terms of um, increasing your, your uptake, but whether or not there's a difference in adherence is still something that we need to unpack. We did find that adherence to the program was quite modest um, with only 2.3 modules accessed um, and only 35% completed the therapeutic dose of four modules. Attrition was quite low to moderate with 23 out of 35 um, completing the post-treatment assessment. Whoops, sorry. Um, so in terms of where to next, and just mindful of the time, we have actually managed to secure Cancer Australia funding, which is so exciting. Um, and where we're gonna be com comparing Finding My Way Advanced with a minimal intervention control condition, which is um, my journey online. Uh, and we'll be doing this in a double blind, parallel randomized controlled trial um, and recruiting via eight sites um, nationally, as well as advertising through Facebook again. Um, so this kind of shows the, the schema for the, the next study. And as you can see, we're going to be trying to recruit a very large sample of 370 women nationally, but it works out to be a roughly 40 participants per site. Um, yeah, after, yeah, or just over 40, about 46. So it, it's not that much more than what we actually had for, for the pilot when it's broken down by site. So in summary, this um, study does demonstrate the co-design process. Whoa, sorry, that went really quickly. Um, for um, developing a self-directed online program for women with metastatic breast cancer. And we have demonstrated through the feasibility data that we need, you need to plan for a slow recruitment rate, especially in the context of COVID, and bolster clinician referral through social media advertising. That we can actually, um, this is in demand, like, you know, when women are offered this program, we do have a high uptake rate, but that um, it's also to expect that program usage will be modest. Um, but also that we had reasonable research retention of 66% at post treatment. So the next step, as I said, is um, you know, stay tuned and we'll be able to report on our efficacy results from our multi-site RCT. And I just want to acknowledge the um, all of the investigator teams so far, and this is not including the upcoming Cancer Australia team. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm just trying to find my button to start my video again. That was a great presentation. I'm saying we've got um, at least one question in the chat, but we will be holding questions uh, until after our three presenters um, have each uh, spoken, uh, and then we'll hold all the questions for the end. Um, so uh, next, we're going to be hearing from Morgan Lesky. Morgan is a PhD candidate at Flinders University, and she's going to be presenting her research on developing the healthy living, um, healthy living after cancer online uh, intervention. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks, Emma, and thanks, Lisa. That was an awesome introduction, I think, to uh, digital health interventions, but I think also to the co-design process as well. Um, as Emma said, I'm a PhD candidate at Flinders University and today I'll be presenting on the co-design of an online healthy living program for post-treatment cancer survivors. Uh, so this is an online nutrition, physical activity and psychosocial um, yeah, intervention for cancer survivors. Sorry, just trying to get it working. Um, so just before we begin, it's important to note that um, it's commonly accepted that cancer survivorship starts at the point of diagnosis. However, in this project, we'll be focusing on the post-treatment phase of cancer survivorship. That is um, a cancer survivor who completed active treatment, such as surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy. Um, sorry, I just wanted to double check. Am I presenting the right, like, the right screen? Because I can't see properly on my thing. Am I? Yeah, you're good. Okay, yep. fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's well documented that engaging in a healthy lifestyle um, after cancer treatment, such as physical activity, adequate nutrition, and maintaining a healthy weight can mitigate some of the challenging impacts of cancer and its treatment um, by improving well-being, um, reducing the risk of treatment-related side effects, uh, reducing the risk of cancer recurrence and other chronic health conditions. However, majority of cancer survivors in Australia are not meeting the recommendations for a healthy lifestyle. In fact, inactivity and weight gain are commonly um, are common throughout survivorship. Uh, healthy living interventions have demonstrated efficacy in assisting cancer survivors to achieve their healthy lifestyle goals. However, these programs are not routinely implemented um, at the completion of treatment. Um, and this issue, as Lisa was talking about, is compounded for those who live in rural and remote areas who often do, are disadvantaged in access to their healthcare services. 
So to address these needs, Cancer Council and the University of Queensland collaborated to develop and, Im and implement Healthy Living After Cancer. So this was a six month telephone delivered intervention where cancer survivors were offered up to 12 phone calls with a Cancer Council nurse to support them in making their healthy lifestyle changes. Um, so this targeted goal setting, physical activity, healthy eating, weight loss and staying on track. Healthy Living After Cancer uh, was offered as part of a research trial evaluating the program's efficacy in supporting the cancer survivors in making healthy lifestyle changes. And although this program did yield significant clinical benefits for participants, such as improvements in physical activity, in nutrition, um, and physical quality of life and cancer-related symptoms, the program wasn't sustainable for majority of the cancer councils um, that took part in the trial. And this was due to the cost and the resources that were required to um, continue the program. So to address these sustainability issues, Cancer Council SA and Flinders University um, are collaborating to develop an online adaption of the Healthy Living After Cancer program, which we have really creatively named Healthy Living After Cancer Online. Um, so online interventions promote the self-management of health and self-directed behaviour change. So as a result, online interventions require minimal financing following their development. So taking this reasoning, adapting healthy living after cancer to an online program has the potential to reach a wider range of cancer survivors who may not have access traditional, to traditional face-to-face -face support, whilst also enhancing the program's sustainability. To ensure that the program does meet the needs of cancer survivors, um, our research team has been taking a co-designed approach to the, its development. So as Lisa was also talking about, co-design refers to the involvement of end users uh, in the design process of the intervention. And this results in an intervention that is more sensitive to consumers' needs and their preferences. So the co-design framework that we've been using for this project is the Stanford's design thinking process as described by Woods and colleagues. And it's an iterative process that involves five phases. So empathize is to understand uh, end users, every, their everyday life. Uh, the define phase is to identify what they want addressed in the program. The idea is the idea, idea generation of what they want included in the program. A uh, prototype is creating a basic visualization of the program. And the testing phase is to refine the prototype and test it with a new group of end users. So the first round of stakeholder engagement was conducted by Ashley Grant in 2019. Um, she was a part of our team then. And this encompassed the empathize and define phases of the co-design process. So this round involved three end user stakeholder groups, including 21 um, adult cancer survivors, 12 healthcare professionals, um, and five NGO uh, cancer support representatives. So this round involved uh, focus groups and interviews and interviews with our stakeholders to define what healthy living means to cancer survivors. And they also had a look at the workbook that was associated with the telephone delivered program. And they had a discussion about what a new version of this program could look like. So two key messages emerged from these discussions. First is that healthy living is defined as a good overall quality of life and includes physical health, mental health and adjustment to the new normal. Second is that healthy living programs should include physical health, mental health and peer support components and also offer a flexible format and long-term accessibility. So we took these findings and we created a black and white uh, visualization of the program, otherwise known as a wireframe. And this current slide shows the wireframe of the home screen of the proposed Healthy Living After Cancer online program. We included all the original components of the Healthy Living After Cancer program and also added modules for mental health, uh, for fatigue management, for finding the new normal and peer support. At the end of 2020, we held the second round of stakeholder engagement, which encompassed the idea and the prototype phases of the co-design process. So this round included, again, focus groups and interviews, and we presented the wireframe of the Healthy Living After Cancer program to our stakeholders. In these discussions, we also used a persona task where we asked stakeholders to create a hypothetical user of Healthy Living After Cancer online. Um, the description of the user included like the age, uh, the gender, the cancer diagnosis, and also healthy their healthy living goals. 
And the reason why we did this was to understand a little bit more about how users might actually use the program and also discuss if there was any other um, you know, ways that we could support them. So we invited all of our stakeholders back to participate in the second round of engagement and 71% um, of our group returned. Uh, so that was 14 cancer survivors, 12 um, oncology healthcare professionals and one uh, cancer support representative. And then we also had an additional um, healthcare professional and cancer support representative join our group. Uh, so overall, the feedback we received suggested that Healthy Living After Cancer Online should be user-friendly, um, accessible, and offer the ability to self-tailor the program. It should also be interactive and include features that assist the user in using the program. It should include links to professional support. It should include access to peer support and provide some support for family members. And it should normalize the after-treatment experience and include cancer-specific information. So the suggestions from the second round of stakeholder engagement were implemented into the development of Healthy Living After Cancer Online. And the key changes included um, the introduction of guidance videos at the beginning of every module to help navigate um, each of the modules. Uh, we also included survivor stories in the find is the new normal section, the physical activity section, um, the mental health, the healthy eating and peer support um, sections as well. We also uh, had pages detailing how to access relevant healthcare professionals uh, in the physical activity, healthy eating and mental health um, sections. And we also included um, tags to let participants or users know uh, if they'd started the module, not started the module or completed it. Um, and we also had two reminders that were sent to you, like reminder emails that were sent to users if they didn't log on uh, for a week. So for the next stage of our co-design process, um, we're currently finalizing our pre-post pilot trial um, to look at the feasibility of Healthy Living After Cancer Online. Um, so a new group of cancer survivors were invited to access the program for three months and to also take part in a interview, a post-program interview, uh, interview to provide their feedback um, yeah, on Healthy Living After Cancer Online. We're particularly interested in the program usage um, of the program's usability and also of attrition um, between yeah, baseline and post-intervention questionnaire. Uh, so we had 15 people sign up to Healthy Living After Cancer Online. Um, this was in about a three month period. Um, and we had 11 people of those 15 who were eligible. Um, the mean age was about 58 years old and majority of our um, participants were female breast cancer survivors. So overall, majority of the participants only accessed the program for one day. Um, and almost half our participants didn't access any of the modules. Um, and only one participant completed all nine of the modules uh, and, and accessed the trackers that were uh, available on the website um, to track their health behaviour change. Uh, we're currently still following up on our last few participants, um, but so far only four out of 11 have completed the three month post intervention questionnaire and three of them have completed the feedback interview. In terms of the feedback that we're receiving so far, uh, two of the cancer survivors said that the topics are really relevant and helpful. Um, however, because the program includes a lot of information, it was really overwhelming to them um, to begin with. Um, and they also identified that it was difficult to stay motivated um, due to their lack of energy um, and lack of you know, willpower. Um, one of the suggestions that we got from the cancer survivors um, was uh, to include a guidance person to help them like orientate to the website um, and also to help set up their goals and you know, assist with accountability as well. So from the pilot trial, we've identified three key barriers to the program's feasibility. First, completely self-guided online programs are easy in, easy out, meaning that they're really easy to sign up for. However, without that person to hold them accountable, they're also really easy to disengage from. Second, the process in which we administered questionnaires may have actually increased the burden on participants and resulted in them dropping out between the baseline um, and post-intervention questionnaires. 
So specifically, we followed um, some advice from the information security team at Flinders University, um, and the questionnaire was separated from the website. So to be able to link participants from uh, their baseline questionnaire to their post-intervention questionnaire, we provided them with a unique ID number, which they could access at any time by logging into the website. But this meant that at the post um, intervention questionnaire, they were required to log back into the website, find their ID number and input this before actually completing the rest of the questionnaire. Um, and we're sort of wondering whether that might actually be deterring participants um, from completing yeah, that questionnaire. Finally, we also had some technical issues um, with the email reminders that I was talking about earlier. So um, people who didn't log back into the website after completing their baseline questionnaire, they weren't um, sent the reminder emails. Um, and we think that this process might have, again, been compounded by the questionnaire process because what we had to do was when a participant completed their questionnaire, we would manually go into the website and tell the website that they had completed the questionnaire. And then the website would send them an email telling them that they had access to the program. Um, so if participants for some reason didn't get that email or just ignored that email, then um, yeah, that might have you know, impacted them logging back into the website and yeah, had that flow on effect uh, to the email reminders. So to address these feasibility issues, we're moving back to the ID8 phase um, of the co-design process. So we've consulted the web developers um, to investigate streamlining that questionnaire process to reduce participant burden um, and to provide them immediate access to the website. Uh, we've also taken on the cancer survivor feedback and we've consulted empirical literature to find strategies to be able to provide that additional support to the users of the program and also to increase uh, adherence or use, use of the program through accountability. Uh, so we identified three different strategies. So um, there's supportive phone calls, um, SMS reminders or coaching, um, or some form of peer support, which could be offered either face-to-face, -face, over the phone or on discussion forums. Um, but to ensure that whatever strategy we selected to try to implement with Healthy Living After Cancer Online you know, has the best chance to be implemented after the testing trials, we consulted um, with our stakeholders at Cancer Council SA. Um, and through these discussions, we selected um, doing two brief telephone support calls at week one and week four of the program and also SMS reminders, as they're already using um, these sorts of strategies with other supportive services um, that Cancer Council SA is currently offering. So the next step is to enter another testing phase um, of co-design where we'll be investigating the feasibility of implementing Healthy Living After, can after Cancer online uh, with the addition of the telephone support calls and SMS reminders. So overall, co-design has assisted with the initial development of Healthy Living After Cancer online to ensure that it addresses the needs of post-treatment cancer survivors. It's also helped us identify feasibility issues with delivering healthy living after cancer online, and also helped us identify how to address some of these feasibility issues and promote that long-term sustainability um, of the program. So before I finish, I'd like to just acknowledge our investigator team um, who are working on this project, IUGO for the website development, um, and also our stakeholders for their time and expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morgan. That was a great presentation and a really good um, overview again of the co-design process. Um, really appreciate that, but I think we will um, hold questions for the end um, and move on to Nicole's presentation. Uh, so Nicole is a, a clinical psychologist with Lift Cancer Care. Uh, and she's going to be presenting to us today on her clinical experience of uh, delivering telehealth in psycho-oncology. Thank you very much, Nicole. And Emma, can you see my slides? Yes, we can yes. see your slides. It's perfect. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Nicole, as Emma said, a clinical psychologist at Lift Cancer Care, which is in the Tennyson Centre on South Road. Some of you might be familiar with it. 
Uh, it's a private allied health clinic with a focus on uh, exercise medicine, but also there's a couple of us psychologists here. And I've been working exclusively in the um, field of oncology for about 15 years now, um, with the exception of a couple of mat leave breaks. Uh, so just going to have a bit of a chat about my experiences of using telehealth and a little bit about using online programs as well. So I've done quite a bit of telehealth in the past before the pandemic and actually was a telephone operator throughout my uni. Um, so pretty comfortable on the phone, but it really wasn't until COVID that it became the bulk of what I was doing. Uh, with the pandemic, I kind of converted to about 80% uh, telehealth, the majority of which was by telephone. Uh, we did offer Zoom to pretty much every patient, uh, but it was taken up fairly infrequently for a number of reasons. Um, did a little bit of FaceTime as well. Um, and it was initially bulk billed as per the Medicare requirements for telehealth um, through the pandemic. So I would say now probably I'm back down to about 15% of my caseload is telehealth. So just firstly, a few barriers to telehealth, some of which should have been, um, have been covered by Lisa and Morgan. Um, one of the main barriers to telehealth is actually my technical ability. So I have to admit that I have yet to set up a Zoom meeting by myself. I have a, uh, there's a lovely admin team here at our day hospital who coordinate things for me and I've managed to dodge having to do that so far. Um, internet connection fairly self-evident, um, can be a problem here in our clinic. There are certain parts of the building that cope better than others. And so I have been known to walk around the clinic with my laptop, trying to find the right spot where the, the screen doesn't freeze while I'm talking to patients, which is pretty infuriating, and has also been a deterrent for patients to continue with Zoom and we've converted to face, uh, telehealth or telephone based. A um, number of my uh, elderly patients have a little less um, access to technology or like me, not awesome aptitude. Um, a lot of patients just expressed preference for face-to-face -face and we were able to accommodate that here at the clinic, uh, even despite the pandemic. Um, got a number of patients who either are hearing impaired or have dysphagia of some sort or perhaps speak, you know, they have a trachea and have a um, speech valve, so um, telehealth hasn't been viable for them. Um, uh, but, you know, it did um, help for our unvaccinated um, patients. So a <clears throat> number of positives about telehealth that I found. The first one, which is a bit um, self-interested, is to say that I still had a job, which was good. Um, certainly with, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a bit of unease about whether those of us working privately as psychologists would uh, still have work. Um, I greatly appreciated the government um, providing pandemic uh, support through Medicare. Um, coming historically from a public health background, I value public health and struggle at times working in a private setting. So that was nice to be able to bulk bill patients for their telehealth appointments. Um, things like actually just being able to stand up and move around while talking to someone has been pretty good for my back. Um, it's been helpful to be able to type directly into our electronic medical record and access previous notes while talking to the patient. You know, if I'd made previous notes about the plan or um, needed to refresh my memory about certain points, I've been able to seamlessly do that without necessarily the patient being aware. Didn't have to wear PPE, which was a relief. Um, I found for a lot of patients being able to provide telehealth either by Zoom or by phone just meant their anxiety about COVID was somewhat alleviated because they didn't have to leave home. And that meant that that topic didn't take up 40% of the session, which is what it did for a lot of, a lot of sessions with a lot of other patients. Um, being able to support palliative patients or patients who are very unwell um, 
there's um, a, a benefit of telehealth, obviously, which I've appreciated. And I also found that some patients who tend toward quite avoidant coping or face-to-face -face, uh, can become a bit closed were actually more open over the phone. And I know there is a, a kind of a disinhibitory effect of online telephone um, engagement generally, um, but it, it was interesting that with some of those particularly avoidant patients, I was able to break through and get get a bit further with them on the phone. However, um, there are side effects or negatives about uh, telehealth, of course, which I'm sure most everyone is pretty aware of. I found that um, doing an initial assessment with someone, so if I'd not met them face to face and our first contact was over the phone, or I was concerned about their physical or psychological risk level, it was more difficult without the visual cues. So doing telehealth, while it didn't turn out that there are any significant issues, it just, my, my sense of confidence in my assessment just was a little uh, slightly wobbly, I suppose, if I hadn't been able to eyeball them. And I think it is, peculiar to a health setting, an oncology setting, that it's being able to visually see someone in terms of their physical risk. So I'm not just talking about psychological risk here or risk of harm, but physically how they're traveling. And it's helpful to be able to see them face to face and to determine if what sounds like low mood is actually that perhaps they're, um, you know, maybe anemic or something and need to get to their doctor. So that was, um, you know, that, that's obviously more difficult with telehealth. I found implementing mindfulness techniques, um, emotional regulation strategies uh, more difficult over the phone and Zoom because you're less able to control the environment that the patient is in. And when I say about emotional regulation, it's also about not being able to eyeball them clearly. Um, over Zoom, so they may sound calm, but when they're fa you're face to face with someone, you can pick up on slight uh, changes and evidence of you know, emotional arousal or physiological arousal that you're able to capture uh, when face to face. And obviously that's more difficult over the phone. Um, I've, this isn't a necessarily a significant issue, but work home boundary um, is not just about, you know, work-life balance and keeping home separate from work. Um, I'm not sure that I particularly appreciate having my patients' issues in the rooms of my home. Uh, so when working from home, uh, you know, I've, I've always had a pretty good ability to separate work and home. I don't worry about patients or think about them a lot after hours, um, but their issues, their mortality, their distress, their grief is now sitting at my dining table or in my study or wherever I am talking to them. So I'm just was mindful of that and I, find that, a, 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 I guess, a particular challenge with telehealth. Um, telehealth, even when I was doing it in the clinic, I found or do find quite isolating from my team. Um, when working from home doing telehealth, uh, the lack of access to the paper files here was sometimes a bit difficult and just made things a bit tricky. Uh, technologies are bit frustrating, uh, frozen screen was almost routine. And many, many times I would be looking at a frozen screen and just kept talking and hoped that the patient could see me on the other end. Uh, my dog likes to bark. So that was an issue working from home doing telehealth. Um, I trust that this is a fairly universal experience that doing a lot of zoom meetings doing a lot of phone meetings is actually just really tiring i think we have to work a bit harder 
in some ways um, to get the information we need when we're doing it without some of our senses. And I think being face to face with people, most people think maybe that's more draining, but I actually find it actually gives a bit of energy. Um, maybe controversially, I think it's important to be able to hug a patient or give, put a hand on their shoulder, particularly if they're bereaved or I'm saying goodbye to them for the last time. And so obviously that wasn't an option with telehealth or Zoom, which was a shame. Now, I did say before that avoidant patients were sometimes more open over the phone, but equally so, some of those really avoidant patients could be even more avoidant on the phone, shut down, even end the call. Um, and one other negative is that I had to remember to turn caller ID off on my phone. I only use my mobile at home, so um, every now and again I forgot, which is a little concern because I um, don't necessarily want clients to have my phone number. Um, so that's kind of telehealth or phone counselling, I suppose. One of the other um, online uh, services that we provide at Lyft is education videos for patients. So there's just a little um, example of some of them. And I think it's a bit of a way forward, particularly as we have quite a long waiting list here at Lyft. And it seems like quite an efficient but personable way to get some information to people, maybe give them a bit of guidance, clearly not individually tailored, but still hopefully accessible for patients when uh, either in between sessions or while waiting for a service. Um, now, I also refer to a number of online resources, um, certainly finding my way is one of them. Again, a bit like our videos on um, the Lyft website, I find that suggesting the Finding My Way um, program is useful for patients on their waiting list, but it can also empower existing patients to access information between sessions. Uh, I also uh, fairly regularly refer to the This Way Up program out of St Vincent's in Sydney, um, particularly the Health Anxiety Program. Uh, I think it's a, a good program. Patients have given me fairly positive feedback about it, but I get limited feedback from the program itself. So even though as a clinician, you prescribe it to a patient and make the referral, there's not, a, there's not kind of a summary of information that comes back, which I think would be helpful. What you do get, however, is very regular alerts about people, your patients having scored high on their distress screening. And, you know, some days I'll have multiple emails from this way up saying high distress, high distress, high distress for various patients. And I know how they most likely have answered the questions and that I know where they're at because I'm currently providing therapy to them. But then I also can't, due to duty of care, not log in and check the results and possibly follow up with the patient. So, you know, there's a little bit of a line between too much feedback that's not super helpful and um, maybe not enough feedback. Got a lot of patients who use the Headspace app, uh, particularly just to learn simple grounding mindfulness techniques and to help them at nighttime getting to sleep. Uh, so I'll often recommend Headspace. Woodify is another app that I've been using for a long time, more in session with patients. Um, Gather My Crew, I did make recommendations to patients um, for a while, um, but I haven't found the uptake that great. Mood Gym, I previously used a lot um, in kind of my <laughs> former clinical life but I find it's not suited particularly well to the oncology populations. So there's a lot of language. It's a very, very, um, I guess, rigid CBT program. And it calls, I guess, unhelpful thinking, something along the lines of warped thinking, I think, so from memory. So when you're dealing with uh, people who are scared of disease recurrence 
worried that they might die, as you would all understand and agree, that's not actually irrational or warped thinking. Um, and so it's not a program that sits very well for the oncology population, in my opinion. Um, and Moojins out of uh, Canberra Uni from memory, they also have their eCouch program, which has a module on loss and grief, which is general, simple, quite normalising program that I have recommended to a number of people. Um, the Black Dog Institute uh, free online clinic, which provides mental health assessment and recommendations, has actually been quite useful to a number of my patients who have generally I'll send people along to that if they're wanting an opinion about whether they have a bipolar mood disorder, bipolar one or two. Um, and then my compass program in uh, seems quite good quality as well. Um, Cancer Council often refer to people, refer people to the website for resources. Um, you would all be aware that many oncology patients will access um, support through Facebook groups and forums, which can be both helpful and very dicey. And so it's important to have conversations with patients about that and being, uh, you know, protecting their own well-being and, and thinking carefully about how much information they do or don't want and having conversations about the type of people or stories that they're engaging with. Um, I'll often refer people to the Advanced Care Planning website for straightforward, helpful advice. And even in session, go through YouTube clips with people. Um, you know, I might show them a little video about um, physiological responses in, when people are panicking and, and simple things like that, just pictures or little cartoons that um, are helpful for some patients if I find that we're just not quite getting it in session. As Lisa and Morgan said in their presentations, the adherence to these various online programs is probably one of the biggest issues. So patients I've found will often be quite interested and maybe do one or two modules of a program and then drop out or go through them very quickly uh, and or, you know, just not persist. So adherence, I think, is one of the biggest issues. Um, and so just finishing up, I'm conscious of time. Um, just some things that I've, I guess I've thought about is that uh, it's really important to set the rules and parameters of your telehealth from the outset, um, insisting that patients are stationary, not in their car and then going to school to pick up the kids and then making dinner while talking to you. Um, and that they're in a quiet place as much as possible. Uh, from the beginning of this year, in our clinic, telehealth is no longer bulk billed. Um, I guess I preferred it that way. Um, and I do have a bit of an internal struggle about the, the efficacy or therapeutic value of telehealth at times. So it is a bit of a challenge for me to people now have to pay a gap to come um, to talk to me on the phone as well. Um, it's really important to make sure your telehealth space is looks like a workspace. I think that will help a little bit with this sense that your patients are in your own home and their issues are in your own home. To help with adherence to self-help programs, I need to get a little bit better at bringing the patient's experiences of telehealth, uh, sorry, the online programs into the sessions. So kind of perhaps setting homework of doing X number of modules between sessions and then reviewing progress, perhaps to help with adherence and to help them get the best value out of those programs. Um, I think there's a lot of value in them and I, you know, I should use them more, but it's also really hard to keep track of everything that's out there. Um, and so thank you for listening. I'm just going to show you this photo. This was the last time Lisa and I met via Zoom. And for 20 minutes of our discussion, this is what I was looking at on my screen. Apparently, Lisa could see me talking and moving my hands and communicating normally. But this is what I was looking at for 20 minutes. 
while I was sitting at my kitchen table. So there's an example of, you know, the sources of one of my frustration. And to be fair to Lisa, because she's obviously very um, clear in that picture, this is what I look like down in the bottom corner. So that kind of captures how I feel about frozen screens and uh, telehealth, I suppose. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Nicole. Very much appreciated that presentation, um, particularly you know, for me as a non-clinician researcher, uh, it's been great to hear about the pros and cons, both of delivering telehealth and also of uh, referring to other online resources. Um, now I'll just move on. Uh, Lisa was uh, going to step us through some work that POCOG has been doing around telehealth guidelines. Lisa, is that still something that you're able to to spend a few minutes on. I'm mindful of, of the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm really mindful of the time yeah. as well. But I think um, I will just say very briefly that um, it, it segues beautifully from what Nicole was saying that I think many clinicians found themselves not quite sure how to adapt um, some of the therapeutic techniques to telehealth. And, you know, I think the assumption was always that we would be doing video conferencing rather than um, telephone. But I think your experience, Nicole, is very much reflected in what we found in some of our research that the vast majority of um, people delivering telehealth was actually via telephone. Um, so as a result of that, um, an expert telehealth advisory group have actually developed some recommendations or guidance document, uh, documentation around how to adapt psychological therapy um, in this space um, to be a useful guiding document for clinicians that are, you know, are gonna likely have to continue to work, um, do this sort of work ongoing. Uh, and at the moment, we're just conducting a Delphi study to see whether the recommendations and the guidelines that, that have been developed are, are helpful. So I just wanted to give that, that study a plug. Um, and in particular, I will really briefly just share the, the, sci the, the um, slide that's got the link to it so people can see it. Or maybe I'll just post the link into the chat. That way, if anyone is interested in kind of contributing to the development of these guidelines and, and seeing how it's going would be really great. But we have um, got five broad recommendations of, of things to consider when you're adapting telehealth um, or adapting therapy to the telehealth setting. So that's the link if anyone is, is keen to do that. Um, but I'm and really mindful of time, so I won't go into any more detail than that for now. Yep, no problem at all. Um, so perhaps if we move straight on then to the, the questions that are in the chat, um, anybody who is, uh, not able to to stay for question time. I totally understand, and I can certainly um, answer uh, questions about the Finding My Way program. Um, and I might start with those. Um, so we had some questions in chat. Uh, first of all, about uh, what kind of Facebook advertising we did, um, because that really did help to improve our recruitment for our pilot uh, feasibility trial of Finding My Way Advanced Intervention um, quite significantly. Um, and we actually did both uh, posts on uh, accounts of relevant organisations that we were partnering with and the targeted ads, which were through Flinders University um, social media team, but it was the targeted ads that led to the um, sudden spike in recruitment numbers. So our, and we had uh, help from the, from the social media team at Flinders Uni to sort of, you know, design an effective ad and make sure we were targeting it to the right groups. And, um, you know, that was sort of released several times over, um, I forget, the, you know, a certain amount of time, a couple of weeks or something like that. Um, so I hope that uh, answers that question. It was very much the targeted ads that were, were helping with, with the recruitment there. Um, the next question on the, um, for some reason I can't scroll down through the questions, but I have made a note of them. Uh, the next question from Ben, thanks Ben, about um, the aim of digital health being um, to make uh, care more accessible and whether or not we should be having broader eligibility criteria for trials, um, even in the pilot phase. I. Uh, my, I guess my um, response to that, and I don't know whether or not Lisa wants to add anything, is that the, the eligibility criteria should really reflect the population that the intervention is being designed for um, and, and, you know, the, the, who the intervention is designed for in the real world as much as possible. So if we're finding my advance, for example, um, we were looking at uh, women with, so adult women with metastatic breast cancer, 
um, provided that it wasn't right at that sort of end of life care um, phase, which wasn't really what the content was designed for. And we didn't co-design uh, the content with women who were in that phase. Um, I don't know whether or not you wanted to add anything to that, Lisa. I, I agreed. I think it's really important for eligibility criteria to be as, as broad and inclusive as possible, being mindful of, you know, who, who which population the intervention is intended to be used for uh, once it's out there in the real world, provided it gets through all, the, all of the um, <laughs> design and testing hurdles that um, these interventions tend to go through. Uh, and the final question I think directed to Lisa about the finding my way and finding my way advanced trials um, is about whether or not there are any guidelines um, to interpret adherence to digital interventions. Um, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lisa, we really look more at um, existing literature on what adherence levels to online interventions tend to be like, not just in the cancer population, but also um, to online, uh, uh, for online interventions to address mental health in general. And uh, Lisa worked together uh, with a previous student to do a systematic review of adherence to online interventions for um, mental health outcomes. Is that correct, Lisa? So, yeah, that's um, right. yeah. so we're really judging, um, you know, modest adherence, for example, um, in relation to adherence levels that were found in that systematic review. Um, we did explore reasons why some participants uh, completed uh, no or, or only one module. Um, and in quite a lot of cases, it was to do with um, uh, personal illness related factors that were a barrier to people um, being able to engage. Um, so people had other issues as well as living with metastatic breast cancer. For example, one participant had her father passed away and her mother was unwell and, and things like that um, can really get in the way. And I think that's one thing to be very mindful of is that, you know, people with a cancer diagnosis, as you know, we're likely to be familiar with also have other things happening in their life at the same time um, and to be mindful that in this population those things do come up. Um, so, you know, from the, from the sort of telephone follow-up and the qualitative interviewing that we did, um, those were the main sorts of reasons that came up. Having said that, most of the people that agreed to do a qualitative follow-up interview were the people who had engaged a little more with the with the intervention. So I'm really talking about uh, people that I was uh, finding to find out whether they had any issue with completing their follow-up questionnaire and that's sort of anecdotal feedback that we had. Um, I might move on to the questions um, about Morgan's presentation. Uh, Morgan, you might want to um, respond to these. So, um, Ben has said again that um, too much information is a is a common criticism of uh, I assume meaning of, of online interventions and online resources in general. Um, and could you suggest ways to identify the essential ingredients of digital health interventions so that we can strip them back in order to promote engagement? Um, did you have a, a comment to that, Morgan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. The challenge that we're facing with Healthy Living After Cancer Online, because we've gone through this co-design process and cancer survivors and well, yeah, all of our stakeholders identified that healthy living, like it's it's a really broad definition that encompasses a whole bunch of different things like the sort of physical health, the mental health, fatigue management, like all those sorts of things. So with Healthy Living After Cancer Online, it's hard to be able to identify, you know, what elements um, do we need to include if we're viewing health as this holistic construct? Um, I guess one thing that I've heard that other digital health interventions have done, um, for example, the, the Be Well intervention that's currently being offered um, at Flinders Uni, I think I've heard that they have um, almost like a questionnaire for participants to fill out at the beginning and then they can, um, you know, that recommends which modules would be good for them to access. So potentially implementing something like that um, in digital health interventions, like actually, you know, providing recommendations about which modules would be really useful for people to access um, might be able to address that sort of, um, 
yeah, that to promote the engagement. I guess we're hoping to do something a little bit similar with our telephone um, support calls in that, you know, the first support call would be identifying what their aims are with the program, what their sort of healthy living goals are, and then make recommendations about what modules would be really useful for them um, to access to be able to, um, to meet those goals. Um, so I guess it sort of just depends on, you know, what is the digital health in, um, intervention? What is that actually targeting? And yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. <laughs> Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. You know, if we can, they're, they're not always easy to um, design or integrate, but sort of having those, I guess, um, ways to screen as to to what people's concerns are and what it is that they're help it, hoping to get out of the the program or the resource can really help to direct them to the right parts of the resource. Because I think with our work co-designing finding my way advanced, one thing that comes out of it consistently is that. There's never a one size fits all and people don't necessarily have the same idea of what's in there or what they're going to get out of it. So being able to kind of direct people to the parts that are relevant to them um, can really help. All right. Um, just, oh, um, another question, and I think this was for Healthy Living After Cancer Online, um, was to, as to whether or not you had any kind of uh, metrics or indication for how much people use the videos at the beginning of each module. Yeah, so I haven't actually had a look at that yet, but I had a quick look um, just before about, you know, how many views we had um, on each of the, the videos and they sort of corresponded to, um, you know, the number of people that accessed each of the modules. So for example, um, you know, the finding the new normal and the physical activity and the My Goals modules, they were the ones that were most recently accessed, now accessed by three people. Um, and each of them had, you know, three or more views on there. So I think it does like give a little bit of indication that they are they are being used. Um, but yeah, I haven't had a whole lot of feedback in terms of how they actually found um, those guidance videos yet with the small number of cancer survivors that I have been able to interview. Um, Certainly no in Finding My Way in our previous trials, we've found that the videos, both the survivor videos or um, the personal account videos of, of women living with it, um, along with the healthcare professional videos are always sort of the most, uh, we, we always receive a lot of feedback about those being really well appreciated and utilised. And I wonder if that also lines up a little bit, Nicole, with um, those educational videos that you're putting up, you know, whether you're receiving feedback on, on those as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the survivor videos was something that came up with um, each of the the three interviews that I did. Like they highly praised the um, survivor videos because they did actually provide that context, and they found that um, they were able to relate to them quite well, and they felt less alone. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that very much rings true uh, with what we've heard with feedback, especially to the videos in the Finding My Way Advanced Intervention. Is that um, people feel less alone and um, find it, I don't know if refreshing is the right word, but they, they find it um, beneficial to be able to hear from somebody with a similar diagnosis. And even if that, that person in the video, even if their experience is not the same, people appreciate being able to hear from people with a range of experiences. Um, moving on with a, a question for Nicole. Um, Ben's asking, are there particular types of patients who seem keen to continue uh, using telehealth now? So I think you said, Nicole, that it dropped down to about 15% of people who are continuing mm -hmm. um, to use telehealth. And, and also what you might think about a hybrid model with um, initial face-to-face -face se face -face sessions um, mm -hmm. that are then followed up with subsequent telehealth sessions. Yeah, um, I think that just the drop down in volume is just people are more comfortable now to come out into the world. Um, people who are maintaining telehealth tend to be those in regional areas. Um, they uh, People who are quite unwell from treatment or um, toward the end of their life. So, which um, is wonderful that it is, you know, support is still accessible for them. Um, I, can't say I have a sense of the people who preferred telehealth over those who didn't. I was a bit surprised by some people that said they weren't willing to do telehealth. They just wanted to do face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. um, as they were people with whom I had a good rapport or a long relationship already. Um, I 
yeah, the hybrid model. I guess what I should say is I, I think um, therapy can be very effective over the phone or via Zoom. Um, my preference actually is phone because then because you're not dealing with the complications of this stilted kind of vision and things when technology isn't great. Um, but I think it's helpful for a rapport to have seen someone and met face to face. And so, yes, that initial session face to face and then subsequent telehealth it seems like a good model to me. I hope that answers the question. I think it's a great answer. Well done. Um, <laughs> I actually um, had a question for you with regard to the videos on the Lift Cancer Care website. Um, do you know how much engagement clients have with those videos? Is there a way that that can be tracked? Um, it's emailed to all of our existing patients. So everyone who has ever attended Lift pretty much gets it sent to them, whether they've seen me ever before or not. So we have people coming in for physio, speech, dietetics and exercise medicine. So it goes out to everybody. Um, and I can't remember the last rate at which they were viewed, but they are viewed and they, they, go, they get often are sent through the Instagram, Lyft's Instagram social media account as well, which, um, you know, honestly is a little horrifying for me, but um, <laughs> a bit embarrassing. But um, the, uh, the, a lot of people watch them and a lot of people give feedback. Um, actually, I, I can't honestly tell you the percentage, but, um, yeah. And um, particularly early in the pandemic, the, the ones about managing anxiety, coping with uncertainty were particularly well received. Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite relevant at any time probably, yes. but particularly yes. at that time. Yes. <laughs> sure. And are they, are they actually available? Like can people find them on the internet? Yeah, or? yeah, they're just on the website under, uh, I think it's under resources or something like that. Yeah, yeah. sure. Mm. Um, a question that I might be able to speak to for finding my way advanced and, and also for Morgan. Um, as to when we anticipate these online programs might be released and available for broad uptake um, and how much do we plan to publicise their launch and promote their availability. Um, I might start with regard to Finding My Way Advanced. Um, so it's been through several uh, rounds, if you like, of development and we're now up to the large multi-site trial to, um, if you like, test the intervention for efficacy and improving outcomes. Uh, so that's a three-year trial um, and provided that it's shown to be a benefit and uh, obviously not to be harmful, then we would be looking at having that accessible to the public after that. Um, at the moment, though, we are about to begin publicising the launch of the um, the beginning of the multi-site trial so we'll soon be um, promoting that through social media because we are um, recruiting through clinical sites around Australia but we'll also be um, recruiting for uh, participants to sign up by self-referring in response to uh, promotion and that includes social media promotion. Um, so I am quite pleased that we're actually um, having that intervention deployed to a live website today um, because that's been through our sort of latest rounds of development prior to the beginning recruitment for the multi-site trial. Um, so people who see the promotion will actually be able to sign up to it as research participants, um, but it won't be available as an open access uh, non-research intervention, obviously, until after the conclusion of that trial. And Morgan, did you, did you want to speak to Halak Online, obviously, still in that co-design uh, yeah, we're still in the sort of feasibility testing phase to actually see whether, you know, it's feasible to implement this intervention. Um, but like the, the next feasibility trial, um, we're hoping to start uh, the 1st of August. So then people will be able to get, same with um, Finding My Way, they'll be able to sign up to Healthy Living After Cancer online um, as a research participant then. Um, and then following that, I guess the long term goal for Healthy Living After Cancer Online is to hand the program back to Cancer Council so they're able to implement it um, into their suite of services. But yeah, given that we're still in that sort of feasibility testing phase, it's still, yeah, a bit unclear about um, if and when, you know, it gets um, released, yeah, to the broader community.
Sorry, having trouble unmuting myself. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Morgan. I'm just trying to check whether or not there are any new messages and questions that have come in while we've been. Uh, um, so Ben's question is, uh, what if the plan, if moderate levels of feasibility are demonstrated, perhaps not sufficient to warrant a larger trial? Um, is this, I assume this is in relation to healthy living after cancer, um, because Finding My Way Advanced is already going for uh, efficacy testing. That's a bit of a tricky one to answer. Um, I don't know, uh, Morgan or Lisa, whether or not you've got a, a comment um, on that. I'd say that decision will be made in consultation with our um, stakeholder group and um, advisory committee. Um, but. In general, I think um, we would be quite reluctant for something to progress without having demonstrated efficacy. Um, and if, if we end up finding moderate feasibility, we would need to probably go back to the ID8 stage again and, and work out what next to, um, to make it actually something that is sustainable and usable. Thanks, Lisa. Um, in the absence of any further questions, I'd just like to thank everybody. Um, first of all, our three presenters for their fantastic presentations today. I think it's given us a really good overview, um, both of the research and the clinical perspectives on uh, digital health in psycho-oncology and specifically how that's been used recently. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody for uh, who dialed in to attend today. Just had one new message to pop up. Oh, okay, no, <laughs> it wasn't a new question. Um, so yeah, um, huge thank you to everybody, our presenters and everybody for attending and also Bonnie for helping to organise this webinar, hugely appreciated. Thank you and thank you for facilitating Emma.